shamanism, to me, is all about relationship. Relationship to the ones we love, to the places we love, to all of those invisible forces that we love, whatever you want to call that, whatever your belief system. For us here in the West, we have been devastated by the forces, the spirit of colonialism. On whichever side of the line you find yourself, we all have lost because of this spirit. And in this episode, I would like to take a look at ways we can reclaim our relationship through shamanism to the ones we love, the places we love, and all those invisible forces that we love, such as meaning, purpose, and passion. Join me. I look forward to this discussion. Welcome to the Sober Shaman Podcast, where we explore ways to make the spiritual practical and apply these medicines to the recovery from addiction and trauma. Thanks for joining me on this edition of the Sober Shaman Podcast, where we're going to be going into the spirit of colonialism. A big topic, and one of the reasons why I'm going into it is because it's an addiction. It perpetuates itself. Let me start with this. One of the things about colonialism, and I'll go back to how it was introduced to me by a couple of my teachers, Martin Praetel and Stephen Jenkinson, talking about the Roman Empire in different ways. But in the Roman Empire, one of the ways this empire grew and perpetuated its growth without having to send armies was pretty ingenious or diabolical or both, depending upon your view and whichever side of the line you were on. But again, everybody loses, except for maybe the people right at the very top, but they're losing too. But let's just stick to this. In the Roman Empire, what would happen is after a new territory was conquered, one of the tenets that was imposed upon the new, newly conquered people was, okay, great, here's a choice. You can either join us or die, right? So what's the choice there? Well, I guess we'll have to join you because everybody else who resisted us is dead now. So as a normal human reaction to survival and wanting to live. Okay, I guess I'll have to join you. Well, glad you chose that. Now, we just have a couple of conditions being the Roman Empire. Joining us, you're going to be the new conscripts to guess what you got to go do. You're going to go even farther out past Rome into new territories and do the same thing to them. Yeah, this sucks. And this is what has been imposed blatantly by the Roman Empire and which allowed itself to continue its growth. Now, I don't know if Rome began this theory? Probably not. Maybe they did. Or maybe they just, uh, at the time period for the tools that were available to them, refined it to such a way that they were able to then go into all of these new places and impose this new way of doing things. What Was it new? I don't know. I, I was 
under the impression from the people I learned to that maybe Alexander the Great did these things, but then there was a scholars who say Alexander actually let these people have their own beliefs and languages and so on. But the Romans cut that part out. I don't know. But these are the things that get lost in this spirit this ravenous spirit for conquest for conquest's sake of more. Tell me that ain't an addiction. To serve this spirit, one had to then relinquish beliefs of religion, for lack of a better term, but it's spiritual beliefs. And again, I'll go back to my earlier definition of shamanism, relationship, one's relationship to their language. Their language was, and hopefully is still, sacred. Language is sacred. It's the thing that makes us human, if beyond everything else. Language, it's special, it's sacred. And in the spirit of colonialism and conquest, that is removed. The sacredness is removed. And we don't even have to talk about sacredness. S sacredness, if we are just, the religion is outlawed. For example, uh, another horrible example of this is, uh, but an accurate example of this is the Welsh knot right? And throughout the English empire, up there in the United Kingdom, one of the things that was done to the Welsh, the Welsh knot, and the Irish had their own version of this, right? The Irish stick, and I don't have the, the indigenous names for this in Gaelic. Um, I'm guessing probably the Scottish had their own version of this too, because the English, this is what they imposed in their brand of colonialism, again, not new to them, but this is what happened. The Welsh knot. The story, as I've heard it, is this. When a child was heard speaking their native Welsh tongue, they would have the block put a, hung around their neck in this wooden block form. So now the child had a wooden block with a rope around their neck and you're it, so to speak. But this game wasn't a game in the sense of that it was fun in any way. Because at the end of the day, and or maybe in that time period, but let's say the end of the day, that was the child who got punished whoever was wearing the block. So, as a child, speaking Gaelic, damn, they got me. I got the block around my neck. How do I get rid of it? Well, I give it to another child who I find was speaking Welsh, Gaelic. I, I'm not even sure if Gaelic was, is the indigenous language of the Welsh, so I'll just say Welsh. So if I find, aha, gotcha, tag your it, I get to take the block off of my neck, back to survivalism, right? And hang it around this new child's neck, and now they're stuck with it until they do the same. So again, this spirit of colonialism is insidious to grow upon itself by getting the victim to become the perpetrator. If that is not a basic tenet of addiction, I don't know what is. Getting the victim to become the perpetrator. That's a story as old as time, right? And one of the reasons why I'm addressing this subject of colonialism and this spirit on this channel 
talking about addictions and shamanism and why this is so connected and a healing pathway out. So this idea of language, another obvious example that maybe people are familiar with is when the indigenous people of North America spoke their language in the Western schools because this is a couple of hundred years, quite a few hundred years after the United Kingdom did this to their indigenous populations of the Welsh and the Irish. The Irish had the, the stick, the notched stick, which basically was the same thing as the Welsh knot. And if you were stuck carrying that home, the parent would look at this Irish a stick and see how many notches were in it, how many times you used the indigenous Irish language, and that would be the punishment, to get the family to be the perpetrator and make the victim of the child so that the child then understood. Same thing here in North America. Well, I'm in Thailand now, but from my native origins of North America, the U.S. and Canadian treatment of the indigenous people and what would happen and the forms of punishment when they would speak their language in these North American Western imposed schools. Why? One reason was language is sacred. Language is magic. In the Western book, right? In the beginning, there was the word. This idea of speaking into being is fundamental. Relationship, right relationship with the people we love. Let's just start with that. Right relationship with the people we love begins with right language or at least at the at some point in the beginning what are the words coming out of our mouth are they inflictive are they defensive are they avoiding are they downright demeaning to keep me in the position of authority as perpetrator right this is how addiction perpetuates itself Right from the get-go, the language we use, the words we use, the content of those words, and then the inflections that we use them with. The Okay, there, there's the, the content of what we say, there's the way we say it, and then there is the inhabiting of that language, the body language, if you want to call it that, and or does our words match our actions? I love you. I love you. Yeah, I love you. Whatever. I mean, three completely different meanings. And I love you. But then how come you go out and you do those things that perpetuate this colonialism, this dynamic of perpetu um, perpetrator and victim? That's not love. It may be the agreement in this relationship, which may have some forms of love in it, but that ain't love. That is the perpetuation of the dynamic that keeps feeding the spirits that keep that imbalanced perpetuator victim roles going, whatever we want to call those roles. This is the same spirit of colonialism. All right, let me, we went, we went narrow down to a personal relationship from a Roman Empire view. Now I'm going to take it back out. And why is this important? What can we do about it? Well, I think it's important 
to understand the spirit of colonialism as, it, as we can trace it to our family directly. And what does that mean? Because this is still going on today. Says the man from North America who's living in Thailand. It's this same running away from or running away to something perceived to be better. I got to, I have to be very careful <laughs> using right speech, right language in not perpetuating this spirit of colonialism, yet at the same time, I know that I am occupying a residence right off the bat that maybe the local Thai cannot afford or in the same way cannot afford, right? So I know that I am perpetuating that. So I have to take responsibility for, and now allow me to go back to, well, what is it that I am running from? And how long have my immediate descendants been running? And what were they running from? And why did they run away? And what did they think they were running to? A lot of questions there. But part of the work that I love doing in my program is getting to ancestry, getting into descendants, getting into understanding and knowing what was it about my parents, their parents, their parents' parents, how far back can I go and understanding as much as I possibly can about the ping-ponging, the yo-yoing back and forth, the yin and the yang of it, because it'll shed, it will absolutely shed light on my addiction and my relationship to the ones I love, the places I love, and all of the invisible forces, whether I call them spirits or the spirits of meaning, purpose, passion, etc. So, for example, when I went back to Italy and my biz biz nono and biz biz nona on two different sides, or same side of the family, but that's where one split happens. My great great grandmother and my great great grandfather came pretty much the same time at the end of the 19th century and landed upon Ellis Island and not Ellis Island because Ellis Island was closed in 1898 and 1899. I never knew that until I looked into these records and did this digging. So this is interesting. And I propose to you one way of doing this. Uh, you know, this brings up, I'm going to put a link in here. I love watching, I don't think it's on anymore, of that television show that looked at celebrities to go back and review their ancestry. Uh, who do you think you are? Or I'll get the name right and I'll put it in the show notes. But it's a wonderful show to watch because we discover things that we didn't know and it sheds light upon them and it sheds light upon the dynamics of why they did what they did and why they acted the way that they do to us. And it gives us a different perspective, specifically on the dynamics of family and shifting that who's above, who's below, perpetrator, victim, maybe. I don't want to put judgment onto those labels, but definitely the dynamic of who's in charge and who's not in charge. So going back to, hi, Kitty, uh, going back to this story of my family and, and going back to Italy and connecting with the great-grandparents and the place upon which they came from, 
this little tiny village of about 2,000 to 3,000 people, which hasn't changed in population um, in the Piedmont region of Italy. Uh, going back to the town hall, I, I don't remember the exact term for it in Italian, but basically the hall of records, right, which was all handwritten, and going back even further, going back to the local cemetery and seeing all of that name, Garbaccio, buried there and talking as best I could to the older people who were just, this is what they do in town where they gather. The men gather here, the women kind of gather there. The men were gathered right outside the cemetery, so it kind of made it easy. Um, in my very limited Italian, as best I could at that time, I had a little bit grasp of the language to try to get some stuff. But more information came when I went to the actual street and found the house upon which they came from. There was a Garbaccio lane. There was a lane that actually was named after my family. And finding the Garbaccio Molina. It's like, oh, some of my ancestors made bread, which was now turned, being turned into condominiums, which was an interesting thing to see, this old, old stone building getting sliced up like bread into spaces for condominiums. Yes. And what I did find that gave me the most information, thank you to that hall of records, was a person who is still alive and related to me, living on that street that I could talk to. And they reached out first for me and made the introductions. And luckily for me, this gentleman spoke English. So what ends up happening? And the light that it shone on my relationship with diaspora, running away, survival on the father's side, which I haven't really gone into, they left Poland for obvious reasons in the 20th century, uh, Nazi Germany moving on in. So I'm sure there's interesting stories there. And again, stories of survival. I'm going to stick with Italy right here because that's the one I followed and that's the path I traveled down. And I haven't talked about this openly too much, but it, it's, a, it's a wonderful story. It's a wonderfully painful story, but it's a wonderfully informative story. So I found this gentleman who was my great, great uncle on one side and living at, on this Garbaccio Street Garbaccio Lane in this little town in the Piedmont, in the foothills of the Alps in Italy. And so speaking with him, what I learned was this. So this, the family split and left at the end of the 19th century for one important reason, survival. This town in the foothills of the Alps was outside, is outside of Biella, Italy. Biella, Italy was the subject of the movie Silk. It was the city that produced something like 90 something percent of all of the fine silk for Europe through those Middle Ages. And it was at the end of the Silk Road, so all this silk that came from Asia was then processed and woven in Biella. Biella was the place that was known for fine craftsmanship for silk products, silk cloths of all types, clothing and everything silk's used for. 
Therefore, it needed a strong workforce from the surrounding area to make these. Well, what was happening at the end of the 19th century? The Industrial Revolution. And one of the things, one of the industries that was first affected was the clothing industry. The removal of hand labor to be replaced by a machine, this was one of the first industries affected. Therefore, what ended up happening was all of these silk mills that were requiring all of this local population to do the grunt work were no longer required. So the first jobs to get lost are always the people lowest at the, at the lowest end of the totem pole, doing the, the work that doesn't require a lot of intelligence and or training, right? This is a timeless story. This is not just my family or this little town in Italy. So what ended up happening was my family left. And this gives insight into why would people put everything they own into a suitcase and get on a boat and go to a place they don't know? I'm leaving a big pause there because myself and my wife fit everything into one carry-on each, plus two cats, and are in a place we don't know. Yes, how this cycle continues. So back to them, the end of the 19th century. Why would somebody do that? This is why. Because the jobs are, are all gone. And these people, my family, got on a boat and went to America. New land, opportunity. Okay, great. Where are you going to go? What are you going to do? The insight that I found that, and I'll tie up this end of the story here, is this. Where'd they go? They went through New York to Patterson, New Jersey. Well, I why would they go to Patterson, New Jersey? Because at the beginning of the 20th century, Patterson, New Jersey was known as the Silk City, the garment industry. Oh, I got a whole book on the turn of the century from the 19th to the 20th century, the rise of Patterson as this city. So what did they need? They needed cheap labor. Where did the cheap labor come from? Hello. One of the places <laughs> was where my family came from in Italy. Now, going through Ellis Island and looking at all those records, I would see sheets from the top to the bottom, like 40 names. If you've ever seen those sheets, it's got the name, it's got who they're related to, who's sponsoring them, what is their occupation, where are they going to live? So this idea of immigration is was kind of the same in a lot of ways. You had to know somebody. You had to be sponsored by somebody. You had to have a place to go, and you had to have a craft to do. So even though these 40 names from this village in Italy, and many of them are my direct relatives, and all of them related in proximity at least somehow, were all coming over under the occupation of Weaver, straight on down that page. Boom. Where were they going? Place going? Patterson, New Jersey. Boom. Why? Because that's where they were quote-unquote needed. The joke is, none of my relatives went into the garment industry, which I thought was pretty funny, but also interesting in that this is kind of how it is nowadays, too. It's like you tell somebody what they need to hear. You tell the colonialist power what they need to hear, 
so that we can survive. We do what we need to do to survive. Okay, that's, uh, I'll chop the story there. Obviously, that those were my great-great-grandparents, and it fills in so many blanks as to why they would do leave what I, going back to Italy, would say this looks idyllic. What a beautiful little village. It looks like a postcard. I could live here forever, right? Survival. And what did they do? And how, well, how were they treated? Now, I'm born and I'm born and raised in New York, so I know the the one word epithets that are slung at anybody and everybody. It doesn't matter where you're from or what you look like or what you do. We got a word that is demeaning to you people, and it's painful, and it was painful to hear those words. And as a kid, growing up under all colors of the rainbow and, you know, it made no sense and it was so stupid that people would use this kind of slang to try to hurt another person because as kids, as friends, we wouldn't do that. You just don't do that. Why? Because as we were hanging on to that part of ourselves together, it was a conscious or subconscious act of, I don't want to be like them. I reject this colonialism. I reject this putting this block the Welsh knot around my neck so that I then do it to one of my own. Granted, we had the luxury of not being beaten if we didn't do it and or the luxury of not being ostracized And hopefully, for me and many of the people I grew up with, and hopefully nowadays, and maybe somebody listening to this, you don't have to do that. And hopefully you didn't do that. And hopefully you can, we can recognize where we are continuing to keep this separation between us and them, between I and the other. Because, of course, that is part of the illusion. Of course, that is what keeps the spirit of colonialism rolling along. As long as I am with the winning side, they will lose. And it's about survival, right? I just listened to another political talk of... Um, Quentin Tarantino on Bill Maher and Quentin Tarantino. As long as we win, we just have to win. It doesn't matter. I'm not going to say anybody's name, but as long as the Democratic candidate doesn't say anything and we win, just, just keep that candidate away from the cameras. As long as we win. Damn, I was like, if that is not a reinforcement of this, how old, how old is this idea that as long as I'm on the side of the winning, I survive? Whether it's this example of the Roman Empire and or this idea of language. Aren't we done with this? Aren't we ready to be done with this? And so, let me slide into the, what can we do about it? Well, the first thing is, is to recognize what I'm doing. When I am doing it, and when I, I am doing the feeding of that spirit of colonialism. 
however subtle it might be, keeping an us and a them, or how blatant I am in doing it. And this will be reflected in my language. First thing, right? The relationship to my language. Relationship to my people with, to the people I love. All right. What about the people who I don't love, I don't know, but I love as another human being? Just that blatant respect and or connection to the other. How do I reinstate the sacred? One of the things I love about being here in Thailand is it's a normal part of language to put your hands folded over your heart and say hello. Sawadika. And it is a wonder, and when we're done, it's a way to say thank you. Kabum kap. And oh, I love how it is reminding me of it's that simple to bring the sacred back into language. And how do I do that? And I sign off all of my podcasts and videos with saying blessings. Do I mean it? Or am I just doing it to get out of here? It's like, yeah, bring it back to sacred language. All right, that's the first thing, right? The, the people we love and the people we don't know, and, but how do we recognize the divine in the other, in our sacred language, and our relationship to that language, and our relationship to each other, and removing that misperception, that illusion, that I am above, and sorry, but you're going to have to wear this block or I'm going to have to go conquer you because I have to stay alive because these guys are biting at my heels. I'm not in that situation. So I have the luxury of going into the responsibility now of making that part of my everyday practice. Second thing would be relationship to place. Now, one of the things that colonialism did and still does is to remove the sacred from the physical. So monasteries and buildings and religious artifacts are destroyed when the conqueror wants to eliminate the conquered people's beliefs. Often, the indigenous people would just rebuild, usually on the same spot. Or if a church was put on the same spot where something earlier was, it's like, oh, good. We don't have to show them, but we know that there's a hole at the bottom of this church that goes right to the sacred that we're looking for. Um, I love that example, and I believe it's Lithuania, where they have that hill of crosses. I think it's Lithuania. And uh, it didn't matter how many times the Russians came in to try to eliminate, and this is fairly recently, right? In the last hundred years or so, the Christian beliefs of the local people, and they would come out and replant their crosses and put it there and honor that sacredness of the place. Sacred places and our relationship to them are important because as it is with any trans-induced state of shamanism, you, you have clear boundaries. I, am, I have a clear intention and I'm going to enter into a trance-induced state, get my information, knowledge, and healing power, and then I'm coming out. We have a beginning, a doing, and an end. Clear. 
That's it. The same thing with sacred places. And so, oh, but every place is sacred. And oh, okay, I'm with that, but that's the problem with everything being gray, is that if we don't have an absolute this is sacred place, then it removes the power and the ability to have a connection to open up that, ah, yes, this church. I light a candle in this church for 30 days because this person has passed and this is where I kneel and I say that prayer every day. Boom. The sacred place provides a sacred structure for us to then perform a ritual of our connection to the people we love, to the place we love, to the invisible forces of whatever it is that we love. This is really important. Reestablish a sacred place, and it will afford you the clear delineation of this place is sacred. Does it make the other places less sacred? No. It's just a reminder that, oh yeah, here's the place where I turn this form of listening on. This is the place where I allow these abilities to listen, to communicate, to connect on. Now, if you call that shamanism, great. If you call that spirituality, great. If that works with your religion, great. If you want to get hooked up to a functional MRI machine and watch your brain light up in certain different areas, great. I don't care. I just want results. And for me, I like the language of spirit because it provides me with these moments of clarity of what is sacred, when is it sacred, how am I falling out of relationship with sacred language, sacred people, sacred places, sacred other things that are invisible. Ah, my relationship, and this will be the last and the third one, to the invisible things. What does that mean? Well, if this is spirit, your relationship to spirit, obviously. And the shamanic journey and the shamanic rites exercises gives us ways to communicate directly to and with and receive healing information, knowledge, and power that directly relate to our specific situations. Boom. There's that. And if you don't like that language, what is your relationship to purpose? to meaning, to passion, to love. These in, um, invisible, unmeasurables, uh, what's your relationship to them? Well, you know, it's interesting because this is what, to go back to Rome, right? Um, earlier before them, the Greeks, and the, lots of people have this idea. Okay, the God of. Well, when I invited the muse in, I was able to write all of this. When I was connected, when I was taken by fill in your god of choice, you know, anger, Aries, right? Oh, it, uh, oh yeah, I was taken by Aries. And I take responsibility for my relationship with Aries and performing those. It's an interesting way of looking at it. And again, to back it out of spirits, but what is your relationship then to these invisible characteristics? And back to the subject of this podcast, this spirit of colonialism, this spirit of victim and perpetrator, 
colonialism, again, is dependent upon separation, is dependent upon hierarchy, is dependent upon a winner and a loser. So taking that out of global or national, bring it into your personal relationships. Where am I? dependent upon using the energy and the illusion of power of being above. How do I use that energy? Do I use it in the form of domination over my subordinates at work? Do I use it in the form of I have more money, therefore I can buy you and treat you like the waiter at a restaurant and being insulting, so on and so forth. Again, the language for me is easiest when I use it in the form of shamanism and spirituality because it infuses a sacredness even to those situations. Is that waiter sacred? What if I think of it that way? Of course they are. If you want to think of it more in a humanistic, psychological, I do not be, need to be in the dominator position here. Am I paying for a service? Yes. Does that person have a responsibility for, to fulfill their obligations of that service? Of course they do. Are you paying for it? Of course you are. I am. What's the relationship? When one of them falls short. Maybe where I fall short. And how do I react when they fall short? Do I immediately go into dominator? Or can I be more in relation with them? All right. The spirit of colonialism. How do you manifest the spirits of relationship to the ones you love, to the places you love, and to all of those invisible forces, whatever you want to call them. And I also propose to you, go back and Ancestry.com, whatever it takes, as far back as you can, and learn all of the stories as to what was it about the times that this ancestor was living. Well, that sheds light onto why they did this. How interesting, which is then why my grandmother did that, which is why my father did this, which is then why I felt this way growing up, which is why I'm doing that to my kid. Oh, boy. Right? How do we stop when we realize and can take responsibility for how we are perpetuating the cycle. Because it is an addictive cycle. Let me know in the comments if this brings up any awarenesses for you, if you've discovered things about your family, uh, your ancestry that have helped you in your relationships with the sacred, with the divine, with your addiction. I'd love to hear about them. And it might be exactly what somebody else is also dealing with and can help them too. So we all appreciate it. And as always, send me any questions, comments, concerns you have. Hit the little like button on whatever format you are listening or watching this. And uh, till next time, blessings. Thanks for listening to the Sober Shaman Podcast, where we explore ways to make the spiritual practical. Please subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. Send me any questions or comments you have. Check out the website, randalllyons.com. I look forward to hearing from you. Until next time, blessings.